Working from home means every day is bring your kid to work day. And if you don't have the right tools and mindset to balance work and family responsibilities, you may end up throwing in the towel. Black Moth Radio gives you the upper hand in starting and managing your ideal lifestyle while creating your own business, doing what you do best, and doing it from home. So, grab the nearest ink pen and prepare to take notes, because this show is packed with discoveries, tips, and experiences to help you through your journey. Let's begin with our host, Robin Bull. Hi everyone, and welcome to lecture number two for the Master Series Freelance Writing. What we're going to focus on for this lecture are the 20 myths of freelance writing. These myths are items that I've heard about during my experience as a freelance writer. To this day, me being able to debunk these myths when they come up is extremely valuable. Originally, I listed these on an old Blogspot account. It ended up being one of the most popular posts. There's a lot of information out there about freelance writing, and unfortunately, not all of it is information that you can rely on. And I know that in my experience, I had to learn a lot, especially in the beginning about trial and error. So here we go. Let's just jump right in. Myth number one, you can only make money by writing fiction. This is probably the biggest myth out there about becoming a profitable freelance writer, and it is dead wrong. Most freelance writers, including myself, make most of their money writing nonfiction of some kind. Of course, there are some who specialize in fiction and they ghostwrite for others. In my experience, though, I have found that ghostwriting fiction pays considerably less than providing well-written and factual information. And how this actually came up for me was, in the beginning of my career, I would go to various functions. And, you know, there's always the question of, well, what do you do for a living? And I would tell people, I, I, I tried different ways of saying I'm a freelance writer. You know, I'd be honest, I'm a freelance writer. I would say I'm a professional writer. I would say I'm a nonfiction writer. And inevitably, the response I would get is, if you're a writer, how come I haven't heard of you? So now I have an answer that I use. Um depending on where I am. Of course, it's really easy to Google me, and that's one of my answers is, if you don't know who I am, look me up on Google. But sometimes, and it depends on who it is, um, but sometimes I'll just say, you haven't heard of me because you can't afford to work with me. So you gotta, you got to learn to have a little fun with it. Myth number two, if you write web content, you have to take slave wages. I hate this myth. It is perpetuated by the idea that the only place you're going to find web writing jobs is through content mills. And sure, those mills exist. The problem is that content mills set you up for disaster. Like, when I used to write for them, I would be lucky if I could make like 10 bucks a day. You can't live off 10 bucks a day if you're in the United States. You never get to know your client. They don't tell you the client name. Oh, and if that client had a previous bad experience, you're the one who's going to pay for it. You have no idea who's giving you feedback, if you're even going to get any feedback. And you're going to get paid far less than you're worth. I've seen so many good writers get screwed over by writing for content else. Like I said, I got screwed over by them when I first started. You do not have to take low wages and write for content mills. You do not have to accept ridiculously cheap rates from private clients either. If writing their own content was so easy that it was really only worth half a penny per word, people wouldn't have a need to look for writers. They could just do it themselves. It is not your problem if they don't budget appropriately for a writer. They don't get to bargain with you for with you, you know, because they don't get to bargain with their internet provider or their electric company. You are a service provider and you are worth your full rate. Myth number three, a published clip can only be found in a magazine. And I, I would actually like to quote Donald Trump here, wrong. The thing about traditional publishing is that it's really hard to break into. 
it's sort of the whole need experience to get experience mentality that's so common in traditional employment. I knew I had to find a way around that when I first started. So what I ended up doing was starting an account on Hub Pages. In fact, I'm pretty sure my account is still there, but I don't use it. I also used a blog. So using a blog and something like Hub Pages can show people what you're capable of doing. Just keep in mind that when you're writing, think about your eventual potential audience and keep your samples written at a professional level. Of course, they need to be easy to understand. I would say about hub pages that you shouldn't expect to make a ton of money there even if you're publishing 10 articles a day. That's because most of the money comes in from ad clicks and your own affiliate accounts. Even if you have a large social media following, you better hope that people are into clicking links. One more hint about the blog. Make sure that if you have one, it has a, an appropriate name. You might struggle to get corporate level clients if you're sending them to a blog that is named something like Sexy Mama 29. Now, if your core focus for writing is going to be erotica, you can be a little more creative and you could even use a pen name. I actually recommend pen names for this because of the way that society treats people who write things like erotica. I personally don't have a problem with it, but a lot of people will judge you because of what you're writing and that can actually sort of bleed over that judgment into your personal life. So you kind of have to be careful. Myth number four, you can write about your favorite thing in the whole wide world and you're going to bank serious cash. To be fair, you're going to get projects that you love, and the more experienced you are, the more often you'll work only in areas that you enjoy. But if you're a weirdo like me and love things like law and textbook writing, you're pretty much assured once you have some experience, you can always write in areas that you like. However, at least in the beginning, if you want to make a living as a writer, you must be willing to take projects that you don't love, and maybe even that you don't even like because those are the things that are going to pay your bills. So take what you can and continue to build your, up your reputation and your portfolio. Myth number five, your schedule is totally flexible. I actually hate this myth. You know, there are a lot of perks to freelance writing and that includes the flexible schedule. The thing is though, it's not 100% flexible. Yes, freelance writing is certainly a lifestyle, but you must be available to your clients. You have to meet your deadlines. You must be able to set a schedule that will work for you and your clients. You must be able to stick to it. Right now, my average day is getting up around 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning if I even slept at all the night before. I have chronic insomnia. I was diagnosed about, oh, I was about 14 years old. I'm at the time of recording this in January 2018. I am about eight months shy of my 40th birthday. So I've lived with insomnia a really long time. I average probably two, three hours of sleep a night. So anyway, I am up and out of bed between 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. I have to get the smallest dog outside. She's a deer head chihuahua. She's not even a year old at the time I've recorded this, so it's really important, you know, to make sure she goes outside first thing. And from there, I will make sure the dogs get fed. I will do the dishes. Sometimes I just sit around and read. I always listen to a motivational video of some sort. Some of them are as short as five minutes long. It might be as long as 30 minutes long. Um, I get the youngest up for school. We take care of breakfast, he gets taken to school, I get home, I plan my day, first thing, 14 minutes, that's about 1% of your day, and then I get going. It may include going to the gym, I may just decide to go on a walk. The thing is, I try to have all of my work projects done by the time the youngest gets out of school. Now, the thing is, you're not always going to have time to babysit the children that belong to other people. You will not have the time to run everyone else's errands. And believe me, unless you're on a desert island, 
people are going to try to convince you to do it because they don't think working from home is actual work and you must be prepared for this. Create a schedule and enforce it. Your clients have deadlines. Your clients may need to contact you through email, Skype, Trello, whatever it is that they prefer. They may have a question and you need to have set office hours so that they know when they can expect a response. And life can get really interesting if you work with international clients like I tend to do from time to time. If you work with people in other countries, make sure that you use your cell phone clock. Go under the clock setting. You're going to see a lot of different city clocks. You can set them up for the, the biggest city near your client and then you know what time it is for your client. Myth number six, <clears throat> the editor is always right. No, they're not. However, it is very, very important that you get a copy of any style guidelines you're supposed to use. It's also important that you use those style guidelines. There have been numerous occasions where I have to play the game edit the editor. Sometimes it happens too often, but when the editor is wrong, and I don't mean wrong over something really small that doesn't matter, you have to be able to approach the editor as if you are a rational adult and not like you're a rabid starving wolf, because nothing rubs a client the wrong way than a smug freelance writer that they do not have to work with telling them 10 ways from Sunday how they're wrong. So you have to learn how to deal with people the right way. Myth number seven, you can work from anywhere. Okay, so this is sort of a partial myth. If you can tether from your phone, if you have a mobile hotspot, if you have a flat rate project that doesn't require you to use a timer, yeah, you can certainly work from just about anywhere. Um, things, the one thing to really keep in mind is that you could be called rude or people will make fun of you for bringing your laptop to a birthday party or some other event for someone. I've had it happen to me. That's actually the most common thing I hear is, oh my God, that's all you do is work. Well, my clients need me. I actually have set hours. I don't work as many weekends as I used to, but if it means meeting a deadline, I'll work whenever I need to work. So there's, you know, keep it in mind. If you're working on an hourly basis, you're going to need to use a time tracker of some sort. Most of those time trackers require an internet connection. Some, such as the one on Upwork, will also take screenshots. And it may also access your webcam to take a picture of your beautiful face so that your clients are assured that you are the one doing the work. Myth number eight, your children, spouse, friends, and family will feel amazingly proud of you because you are a super awesome freelance writer living the dream and you will command the respect of everyone that you meet. I'm lucky that I have an extremely supportive spouse and children who have seen the light. Well, the teenagers have seen the light. Little ones don't really care as long as you keep buying the goldfish crackers. I'm not sure that my husband really understood in the beginning about why I didn't have time to go do certain things or just drop certain things and, you know, do it later. And then he offered to help and he learned pretty fast. Of course, turns out he's a quick study and pretty good. He said though that the first thing he learned that when he was helping me, he didn't want to write for a living. <laughs> He does continue to pitch in when I need him. He's really, really good as far as helping me with the administrative functions of the business. The second thing that he told me that he learned was from planning to execution, professional writing takes longer than he assumed that it would. The third thing he told me that he learned was that when I wasn't actively writing something, I'm not getting paid. Of course, that affects the bottom line for our household. But again, he's always been super supportive, and a good deal of that is probably because his mom worked from home as a medical transcriptionist when he was a kid. But I've been in situation previously, previous relationship, 
people aren't always supportive. Family members, friends, they're not always supportive. And at least when it comes to your children, you have to teach them to respect your working time, and that's not always easy. You have to learn how to work around their needs, especially if they're babies or toddlers. But as far as teaching school-age children to respect your work time, you must continuously enforce your boundaries and your schedule. I stop if my youngest son needs something. My older two, one is almost 20 at the time that I recorded this podcast, and the other one will turn 18 this year. Both have helped to some degree in my business. So they know, they understand, they know the work that it takes to do what I do. Um, and at this point, they understand unless there's something seriously wrong, it can wait. Myth number nine. When you announce you've become a freelance writer, people will flock to you and pay you for your brilliance. No, they won't. You have to have a website or a blog. You need to utilize social media. You need to have a portfolio of some kind, even if you're just using hub pages or something like that. You need to use videos. You need to use podcasting. When it comes to my own accounts, I don't do a whole lot of self-promotion on social media, my podcasts, blogs, or whatever. I'll send out links to stuff that I've written, but I'm not like, hey, click this because I wrote it. The thing is, my goal, whether I'm sending out my own links or I'm answering number questions 10. You need an people, agent to write and publish. It's a not traditional self Agents are a I just good idea if you want to there. get in with a traditional I want publisher. people to go. Fact, I want some to publish my links. I want even to even talk to you or whatever if I've you written. do not have an agent. But you I want people to know the agent if you just want to get your story out there. I but love agents. I it's think how most people agents are who fantastic. I am, and they find me if they you just have services. options. It's not me just publishing shoving exists. my down their There throat. are indie publishers who will talk to you treat like yourself an agent and present yourself. So like you have options to get your book out there. Um, something writer. to keep in mind, though, if you're trying to pitch your self-published work to an agent, good luck. It's probably not going to work out. Most agents won't touch it because they consider self-publishing is already published. So. Myth number 11, any competition or any place that asks for money, such as a reading fee, must be a scam. That's not necessarily true. Yes, you need to do your research. Um, depending on your age, you may remember reading in magazines back in the 90s about the poet search. You'd submit your poems and you'd get this letter about how awesome you are. And, oh, hey, if you want to see your work, because they're definitely publishing it, just buy this giant-ass anthology for just $75. The thing is that pretty much anyone who submitted something to them got accepted and put into the anthology. So, yes, you got to do your research. But just because a competition or a magazine, whatever, has a reading fee or an entry fee doesn't mean that it's a scam often they use that money to get through the publishing process and if they have an actual monetary prize that's how they get the prize money so yeah there are some shady people out there but do your research and yes it is okay if the final prize is you know one or two copies of the work that you're published in and you don't have to pay anything to get them so keep it in mind If, myth 12, if you get a rejection, you are a terrible writer. This is an awful myth. A rejection just means that your work isn't a fit for them right now. It does not mean that you are a bad writer. Myth number 13, your mom loves your work, so you must be good enough to make it in the writing world. No, my mother hates my fiction work and I do have one self-published novel out there, did pretty good. Um, she doesn't read my nonfiction work. Then again, though, what I generally write about isn't considered super exciting unless you enjoy law or academia. What my mom knows about freelance writing, what I do for a living is that I sit in front of the computer and type. I'm honestly sure that my husband's grandmother 
has a better grasp of what I do than my own mother. So what I'm really getting at here is don't get your feedback on your writing ability from your mother. You need feedback from other writers, you need feedback from editors or other industry related people. And when you get that feedback, take it in a constructive manner. Don't become a sensitive Sally. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Drinking water. <laughs> Myth number 14, being a freelance writer is super exciting and easy. That's a big fat no. And it gets even more complicated if you have family responsibilities. It can be boring. It can be hard. We don't have people to meet with at 3 o'clock to talk about the latest current event. Personally, that suits me fine. I'm so introverted that I fall off of the Myers-Briggs test chart, so I'm about as low maintenance as someone can get when it comes to social interaction. But if you become a freelancer, you have to remember you must get out of the house or you're going to risk becoming far too isolated. It can cause depression, even if you don't have a history of depression. If you do have a history of depression, it can make it worse. So make yourself get out of the house, even if you're just going to take a walk around the block or go to the grocery store. Freelancing, it's also hard. Clients can cancel your project, but that's not necessarily a reflection on your work. It just means that their needs change. You may have clients who don't pay. Maybe they pay late. You may not have enough work. Working from home means you don't ever really get away from your work unless you're lucky enough to have a dedicated home office. The other thing is if you can't handle risk or uncertainty, freelancing probably isn't for you. And just because you start freelancing and then decide you don't like it, it doesn't make you a failure. It just means that you tried it and you don't like it. It's not really that big of a deal. Myth number 15. Writing is stress-free because you get to do what you love, and this myth drives me nuts. Writing is not stress-free even though you like to write. When it comes to freelance writing, there's no paid time off. You do not get paid sick leave. No vacation. If you're not working, you're not going to get paid. So the week you had the flu, you better hope you had the money to make up for that. Always, always, always thinking about your next project. Myth number 16, writing is creative and awesome. Another partial myth, it can be creative, even if you're doing nonfiction. My first year as a freelance writer, I had to write about various treatments performed in a dermatology office, and this particular dermatologist had 12 offices or so, different cities, he pretty much wanted the exact same content for each city, but if you know anything at all about professional writing, web writing, SEO, you know that you cannot have exactly the same content or it ticks off the search engines. So I had to get really, really creative. And it's pretty much the same thing with legal writing. I could write five articles in a week about California truck accidents. You have to know how to be creative. It's not always awesome though. It's it's awesome to get paid for working from home, but you know, it, it can be a little boring. There are clients though who have specific guidelines for their content. If they do, you need to make sure you follow those. The thing is, those guidelines could take away from your ability to be overly creative. So, your brain will hurt, you will probably cry, and you will no longer think that freelance writing is so amazing. Myth number 17, your writing must be perfect or you can't be a writer. Here's the deal, as long as your writing is good or at least passable, you can probably make at least some extra money as a freelance writer. Magazines, websites, you know, all these places have editors. However, that's not a license to purposefully write a page full of crap. You need to do your best to eliminate typos and other little issues just because it reflects on your professional appearance. And doing so can lead to repeat work. Your writing ultimately just needs to make your client happy. Always go above and beyond, even for one-time projects. You never know if you'll hear from them again,
But if you do, it's because they remember what their experience was when they worked for you. Myth number 18. You shouldn't write for startups. I love startups. Do some research and ask the right questions. Get to know the startup and the people involved to learn whether or not they have an actual budget. Of course, they may not have a huge budget right now, but most will appreciate hard work and will come back to you if your rate is fair and you treat them like they matter. I've worked with a startup that is worth millions of dollars now. I'm still a standby writer. This particular startup works in multiple countries. They need people who can write in multiple languages, and he knows when he needs someone to write or edit something in English, he has someone ready to help him. Um, there is one particular problem with startups, though, and it actually ties into myth number 19, which is writing for exposure. Specifically, how writing for exposure will get you extra clients. I do not write for exposure. As one of my best friends loves to say, people die from exposure. I do not write for ad share revenue either. And that's because if they had the clicks to actually generate enough ad share revenue, they'd have a budget for a writer. Because the thing is, just because someone goes to visit a page and read something that you wrote, the company isn't necessarily making any money. People may actually have to click on ads, and most people do not like clicking on ads. So, you know, again, if they had ad share revenue, they'd have a budget. And you will get exposure, ad share, and write for free requests. It's not going to get you more exposure. You are suckered into giving free content. You can create your own exposure. No one but you can guarantee whether or not you're going to get the exposure that you need. Huffington Post is a major example of writing for exposure. I go and I read my fair share of articles there. The thing is, they're profitable. They have the money to pay writers. They just don't. Their, their whole catch is, you write for us, you're writing just for exposure. And that's not exactly fair for writers, because we have bills too. So, myth number 20, if someone says to you they're a writer, they know what they're talking about. Not necessarily true. People can say that they do anything in the world. Someone burning the midnight oil to write the next great American novel while they're working full-time definitely has all of my respect. With that being said, though, that does not mean that they necessarily know anything about the professional writing industry. So just be careful where you're getting your information from. There you have it, the 20 myths of freelance writing. You can find me on Twitter and Facebook, facebook.com slash the Robin Bull, twitter.com slash the Robin Bull. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully, you're walking away from this podcast with a plan to implement the tips you've heard, a great attitude, and you subscribe to Black Moth Radio to ensure that you never miss any of the goods. Whether you're a hopeful work from home freelancer or you're well settled into your work from home lifestyle, we hope you've learned something that you can use. If you're ready to know more about the work from home lifestyle, check out cellfy.com slash Bull. Questions, comments? Let Robin know by going to facebook.com slash Bull or confessionsfromthecouch.com. Thanks for listening. Join us next time and keep learning.